The time is 1.15. It's time for IC Newsreel. As you may have heard, Lord Jackson of Burnley, pro-rector of Imperial College and professor of electrical engineering, died at 10 o'clock yesterday morning. Here is one of his colleagues, Professor John Brown, head of the electrical engineering department. <clears throat> Lord Jackson, or WJ as he was universally known throughout the college, was perhaps one of the best known figures in college life. And I think one of the uh, <clears throat> best tributes to him was to record the very deep sense of personal loss which everyone felt yesterday on hearing the sad news of his death. He had made many friends in the college, among staff and students alike. Although he was very closely associated with electrical engineering throughout the whole of his working life, it was partly accidental that he turned to electrical engineering. <clears throat> his original intention had been to study chemistry but the year before he started as a student himself, he spent a summer vacation in the, bar, the power station at Burnley, and the interest which this generated in him caused him to change from chemistry to electrical engineering. He had a very distinguished career as a student, <clears throat> and very rapidly, uh, on completing his degree, started his long connection with education, first of all at the Bradford Technical College. After a few years there, he spent some time with Metropolitan Vickers, a firm with which he had a lifelong connection, first of all as Metropolitan Vickers, and later as Associated Electrical Industries. The connection with Metropolitan Vickers played a very large part in his approach to education, in that the association he formed as personal assistant to APM Fleming at that time the research director at Metropolitan Vickers convinced him of the importance of associating education with industrial activities and this was a theme which ran through virtually everything he turned to in later life. His first connection with Imperial College was when he became the head of department in 1946. At that time the college was recovering from the strain of the war and the electrical engineering department, like many others, was faced with a major task of reconstruction. Under WJ's guidance, during the period 1946 to 1953, the department was converted into one of the most forward-looking and most thriving departments in the whole country. In particular, he initiated many developments in the undergraduate course, and it was one of the first to realize the importance of making engineering degrees much more scientifically and mathematically based. On the research side, he selected a large number of individual members of staff who collectively built up one of the most effective research teams in the country. Having done this during seven years, W.J. probably felt that his job was done, at least for the time being. And when he was given the opportunity of returning to industry as the director of research of AEI Manchester, he seized this opportunity very readily because it gave him once again the, the opportunity to follow this theme of interrelating education and industrial activity. He stayed with AEI Manchester for a number of years and as director of research and also of education, he played a very major part in continuing the activities of the, the Manchester Apprentice Training School, which has itself contributed very largely to the development of electrical engineering education. Eventually, following further mergers in the electrical industry, he returned to Imperial College as head of department again in 1963 and during the remaining years he spent in the college his attention turned very rapidly to much wider issues. Issues on which as pro-rector he has been particularly engaged 
for the last two and a half years. Amongst the, the, the many issues in which he took a, a very close personal interest was the question of diversification, the need to <coughs> dilute the purely technical courses in engineering by studies of sociological subjects, economics, languages, and so forth. And it is very largely due to WJ that we now have the situation within the college where engineering students, in particular, have got very considerable opportunities to study such subjects. He also tried persistently to build up a college viewpoint on matters such as diversification. And in recent years, he has been very concerned to try and reduce the departmental barriers and the consequent restriction which is the active part in the Institution of Electrical Engineers becoming its precedent. And uh, it is perhaps uh, <coughs> interesting that in my own case, the last time I saw WJ was in the institution building only three or four days ago, where once again he was displaying the kind of interest, the desire to get the institution moving into present-day situations, which he had consistently done during his very long association with it. He also played a very important part in many other activities. For example, he was chairman of the Television Advisory Committee, which advised the Postmaster General on the changeover from 405 to 625 lines, the problems involved with color television, and many other aspects of television as we now understand it. Well, within the college, there will be many things by which he's remembered. It's perhaps again fitting to draw attention to the fact that this, the first of the TV newscasts which will be occurring in the college, can occur only because WJ took the initial steps many years ago in providing within the electrical engineering department the television facilities which are being used for this newscast. I, I think it would be uh, equally necessary and perhaps in many people's viewpoint much more important to draw attention not only to his achievements, the achievements which will be recorded and by which he will be remembered, but those of us who have known WJ will remember him as a person, a person who was intensely human in his individual relations, a person with whom one could have a disagreement, a person who, if necessary, could exercise admonishment, but who at the end finished off any discussion with a little twinkle in his eye, which made one realize that he was a very, very human person. And I think it's in that way that he would wish to be remembered by the college. Thank you, Professor Brown. Here is the rest of the news. The first touchstone weekend of this term took place on the 7th and 8th of February at the ICE field station at Silwood Park in Berkshire. It was called, What is the University for? Trying to help answer this question was the guest speaker, Professor W. R. Niblett, Professor of Education at the University of London's Institute of Education. Professor Niblett spoke of a dilemma facing universities in turning out the trained technologists that the, that the economy needs, whilst at the same time trying to educate them broadly. Student unrest is perhaps partly a revolt against expertise and narrow curricula. We are all trained as experts. But who is trained in what expertise is for? We all have our specialisms in society, but who is to be committed to society as a whole? This, of course, has immediate bearings on the situation in IC over diversification and the present unrest caused by the failure of the IC AA merger. But more of this later. Now, union. Here with us this afternoon, we have Piers Corbyn, the IC union president, talking to Howard Matthews, the former RCS broadsheet editor. Uh, there will be an IC union meeting in Meckenge 220 tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock. Uh, now with me this afternoon is Piers Corbyn, president of ICU. Now then, Piers, Hello. Um, what are the main items going to be discussed at the union meeting? Well, this will be quite an important union meeting. 
we're going to uh, assess some of the successes or not of certain union policies. Um, the first item on the agenda will be concerned with the Architectural Association merger breakdown. Um, I'll, do, I'll be able to report anything which has developed since uh, Sunday. Um, on Sunday, NUS Executive took up the AA issue uh, and um, they will be discussing the DES at a national level. Um, the NUS are also going to consider any requests from IC students to help us get the representation we want. The second important item we'll be discussing is refectories and facilities, improvements in them. Um, the, the, the rector said to Jurgo that uh, um, our ref refectory considerations are being considered urgently. Uh, I assume this is following our boycott. The college seemed to have taken some notice of what we're saying. The Imperial College Representative Council, you know, was recently um, ignored by the college uh, and they've refused to recognise this. Um, this was fruitlessly discussed on Jurgo on Monday. Uh, I'll give details of the discussion to the UGM. Um, the ICAS TMS are rather angry about this rejection by the rector. Um, I think personally that we should do something about it. Um, what, what sort of thing? Uh, well, um, I'll say that in a minute. Uh, the, probably the most important item on the agenda for IC students uh, is a discussion about representation. As you know, the Board of Studies is at last going to reconsider our request for representation of five students. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what their decision will be, but if their decision is again no, or something which is unacceptable to the Union, I think we ought to consider doing something. Uh, well, we've been talking about uh, getting representation and all sorts of things for, well, half a year now. We have achieved quite a lot by just talking, but there seems to be a limit to what we can achieve by doing that. I'm not sure what sort of action people are going to suggest, if any. Um, uh, well, one thing people are saying is uh, sit in the senior common room. Other things people are saying is uh, stop the lifts in the college and so on. But basically, it's up to the union to decide what we do, if we do anything at all. So I should urge as many people as possible to come to the union meeting tomorrow. All right. Thank you very much, Piers. I wonder if you were at this. Oh, took place in a new college block at the end of January. This, of course, is the City and Guild's major social gathering of the year, and was the first time, in fact, that the college block had been used for such a large event. The guest speaker was Mr. W. P. Forster, an old centra sorry Foster, an old centralian of some note, and of course, all the IC notices were there as well. There was, it appears, a smashing cabaret which included a knife-throwing act by Cody and Aran. And a spectacular fire-eating act by Kim and Karen. Lots of people came, and the whole evening, apparently, was a great success. On February the 10th, there was a moratorium organised by the Union to show dissatisfaction with the breakdown of the Imperial College Architectural Association merger. Um, we have with us this afternoon one of the co-organisers of this event, uh, Mr John Goodman, and we hope he'll be able to clear up a few points about it. Nothing, John. Uh, first of all, what was the uh, idea of holding a moratorium? Well, the idea developed from talks held between AA and IC students in the small hours of one morning after the breakdown of the merger had been announced. Um, the idea behind it was basically to, to draw everybody's attention to the issues involved, um, to, to get people aware that this had taken place. We thought this was a good way of doing it, a different way of doing it. In addition, we wanted to get this news into the mass media. Um, we thought this was a good way of doing it. We wanted to enable people to show their feelings in a different sort of way. I see. And uh, were you happy with the results of this? Yes, very happy indeed. Um, we got 500 people to what was really the first public demonstration ever held in Imperial College. Um, I think this is very satisfactory. And um, what effects has it had? 
Well, um, I think we've succeeded in most of our aims, if not all of our aims. We, um, we've got on the front page of Senate, we've got nearly all of the front page of Senate, in fact. Um, we're on Stoic today. Um, <laughs> yes. More people know about the problem. I think more people know about the AA than um, probably know about any of the other areas of conflict, areas of discussion in the Union. Um, this couldn't have been said to be the case before the moratorium was held, I'm sure. And um, to what extent did the AA students participate in it? Uh, a number of AA students came along. We weren't sure of the exact number. Um, they are, of course, themselves very much involved in forming plans for the future of the Architecture Association School, so they don't have much time to come all the way over here to par participate. We did have their full support in a letter received from them mm -hmm. about this matter. And um, why, in your opinion, should the merger take place between IC and the AA? Well, for a number of reasons. Firstly, from their point of view, they have a lot to gain from coming here and uh, uh, taking advantage of, the, of what we have to offer. They were going to form part of the Civil Engineering Department. Uh, it's well known that architects are rather short on expertise in many facets of engineering, which they really need when they become architects. We could have um, organized this in a much, much more efficient way than if they are separated from engineering establishments. From our point of view, we would have had a department of environmental studies, of social studies, of non-scientific studies. In other words, we'd have had a department of diversification. We'd, it would also have been seen, um, from the administration's point of view, that they were um, capable of accepting that there were other systems of organizing an academic institution, apart from the hierarchical structure we have at Imperial College. They were seen to be able to accept that there are other ways that you can run an academic institution. And uh, if, these, if the merger fails, the I AA are in danger of closing, closing down? Right? Yes, they are indeed. They are in need of money. The lease runs out. Uh, they're building in Bloomsbury. In five years' time, they have a five-year course. They therefore need to be assured of their home in five years' time. Uh, at the moment, they are working day and night um, in sort of an emergency situation to try to find alternative ways of carrying on. Uh, and there are, they are, in fact, now drawing up plans to close the school this summer, if need be. Hmm. Well, uh, we have with us here, John, some uh, film of the uh, moratorium. Perhaps you'd like to talk us through it? Yes, yeah, certainly. Spike quad. Yes, there you see the flag hanging at half-mast above the bite building. Here the procession preparing to start off from outside the arch. Gallows courtesy of RCS. Hmm. And the wreath prepared anonymously. View from the area of a building. You can see there the banners hung from the Bite Building, prepared through the pre previous nights. Piers, <laughs> John Butterworth, yours truly. <laughs> And then here's the procession moving off. John Butterworth, John on, the Butterworth on the left. And here we see the ever enterprising members of Guild's Carnival muscling in on the act with their own expertly prepared coffin, which led the procession, in fact, all the way. A plaster dummy was also carried, two plaster dummies, in fact. Interested members of the public taking bump sheets from Imperial College representatives. <laughs> An ensnared bus in the background, you see. And here's the procession turning into Exhibition Road from Prince Consort Road, collecting a new convoy of cars behind it. The tuba player.
once again. These scenes are taken as the procession entered Imperial Institute Road from Exhibition Road on its way to the Queen's Tower. Here are people approaching the Queen's Tower. Interested onlookers from College Block. Just one interesting feature was that College Block windows were entirely taken up by pe interested people watching. The lions looking on impassively. Here are scenes. At this point, there were about 500 people. 532 were counted. Whilst the speeches on Queen's Tower took place. Piers Corbyn speaking to the throng. He made a brief summary of the problems. Speeches were also made by Dave Yorth from NUS Executive and by Seamus McBride, one of the AA student representatives. This is Piers myself laying a wreath and a plaster dummy at the rector's door. We had intended to give the wreath in, but the door wasn't opened by anybody, even though we knocked a number of times. These are scenes in Queensgate. Some rather irate vehicle owners delayed on their journey by the procession. more interested onlookers. Hmm. Well, uh, thank you very much, John, for coming along and uh, talking about the moratorium. Um, goodbye. Now a few words about coming events. Next Monday's Wellsock meeting is a lecture on the subject of the famous Black Arrow project. Mr. J. Twin of the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough will be discussing this project and describing the RAE's efforts to put a British satellite into orbit. Other coming events in Wellsock include two Tom and Jerry cartoons, another widescreen fi feature film show, and a visit to the National Physical Laboratories at Teddington. More immediate interest tomorrow. Apart from the uh, exciting union meeting at Mechenge 220 at 1.15, you also have drama, art, politics, and music to choose from. Drama, there are two one-act plays performed by Dramsock in the Union Concert Hall at 1.15. These were entered in last week's uh, Yulu Festival and are well worth seeing. Then in, in Physics Lecture Theatre 1 at 1.30, Patrick Carpenter will be talking about pop artist Roy Lichtenstein. He's the one who does all the cartoons with the blam and the wham. It's a very good artist. And then politics, Ken Minogue in Mechenge 342 at 1.30 gives another of his famous talks. This one will be on Marshall McLuhan. Um, the medium is the message man. And then finally, music. The lunch hour concert will be given by the Wanstead Trumpets and will include works by Vivaldi. This will be at 1.30 in 53 Prince's Gate. Well, that's all for today. Thank you very much. <laughs>